Right, we can go. Here's Liam with the Service Revolution. Okay, hello everybody, and um, it's nice to be here. So first I want to say a massive thank you for the organisers for letting me speak today. Um, I was supposed to do this a few months ago, but unfortunately something happened and I couldn't. Uh, and secondly, it's great to see so many familiar faces in the crowd, uh, colleagues, ex-colleagues and friends in the community. So it's great. Uh, today we're going to be talking about serverless. So this is a really cool subject, or at least I think it's a really cool subject. Um, I've been doing this for about a year now, so looking into serverless, how it works, the different sort of functions. Uh, and I thought I'd share my knowledge and what I found out about it so far. So, who am I? Sorry, if you're not going to use the lectern mic, can you use another mic instead, please? I am using the lectern. It's not you can't hear it, sure thing. Okay, can you hear this? Not yet. Yep. yep. Okay, you got it? Alrighty, so who am I? Uh, I am a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft, and yes, I've walked into the lion's den, which is quite fun. I work on DevTools at Microsoft, so that's the Azure Developer CLI, the AZ CLI, so the Azure CLI, uh, Codespaces, Copilot, and all those kind of wonderful things. Uh, I'm an Authzero ambassador. I think about security. I, I think it's uh, a wonderful subject to speak to developers about security uh, because often they don't think about that first when coding. I'm a Dev Network Advisory Board member, which basically means I judge CFPs and I organize hackathons and have great fun in the community. And of course, I travel the world with a few cool pictures up there. Quick agenda. So I'm going to talk us through a 20 year timeline, thereabout, where we've come from to where we are today, and it's loose terms. Going to look at what serverless is, some challenges, examples of serverless, and some DevOps, because hey, hey we're, we're here at a DevOps meetup, right? So, someone take a quick punt. How much do you think it cost in the year 2000 to launch a tech company? Someone shout out. Three million dollars. Oh. Five million. Bang on. $5 million, near enough. And this was pulled from a sublink in Gartner. Okay, this was a really cool, I, I did some deep diving on these numbers to try and find out exactly how and why it came to that number. So we started with on-premise servers. You'd buy this, stick it under the stairs, in the cupboard, it would be expensive. Utility bills, teams to look after it. You had on-call, you had so much to pay for. It's just capital expenditure, you're paying forward, really expensive. And then we went to virtual machines. So this is where it is now active as needed. Okay, they're not on 24 seven, they're on, I don't know, as you want them, few hours, few days, few weeks. They need patches. That's multi-tenancy. That's where it started, where we ended up using multiple users on the same server. However, this was the shift to cloud. This is what we were looking at now. And you pay per virtual machine. So you weren't paying for this entire rack to be there for a year to update next year. Completely obsolete now. And then we came to containers. This was fun. This was 2013. Docker came about. Containers were there way before, but they weren't really used. 2014, Kubernetes started on the scene. The cloud migration, tools to use them. Scale. Now this is where you started paying per service. You weren't paying for pods, you were paying for the service. So, container instances, Kubernetes, management services. Then we dropped into serverless. Now this is where we broke it down even more, added another layer of abstraction. And I believe, as we're in AWS, uh, I think it started in 2014 when they released Lambda. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. So what is serverless? Well, disclaimer, servers are still used. Now you hear this all the time, and I don't like the word serverless because it's still code running on a machine somewhere in the world. Just adding that extra layer of abstraction, you just know less about it. So if you Google it, or Bing it, or DuckDuckGo, or whatever you want to do to find out what service actually is, you get a load of word spaghetti. I care about six words in that sentence. Cloud service provider manages the infrastructure. That's pretty much what we're looking at right now. Who's seen this before? Show of hands. The shared responsibility model. Okay, so about half the room. Good. So a quick overview. This just shows the level of responsibility a user has, i.e. you and me, versus a cloud service provider, Microsoft, AWS, Google, etc. Okay, so it just goes to show who is responsible for what when you're deploying your applications and writing your code. After some research of digging into where 
serverless would fit in here because you've got on-premise where you own everything versus software as a service, i.e., I don't know, Office 365. You just write your Word document as long as you can get it. You don't care whether it's running on a Linux box or a Windows box. It's just there. Function as a service kind of drops into platform as a service because you care about the information and the data, but you really don't care about the physical data center at all. You've kind of taken all of this abstraction away from you. Now, a better way to look at it is with an iceberg. Now, this is a perfect example of what function as a service is really like. You just care about your code. You don't care about anything else. You just want to write your code as a developer, or at least that's how it should be or seem. So let's break it down just a little bit. Here's a quadrant. Serverless is where you don't do any server provisioning. You don't care about that server. You don't care whether it's Windows Server, Linux, Solaris, you name it. It doesn't matter. You care about whether it's automatically scaling and it should scale automatically with your usage. So let's say you have a Black Friday sale and somebody is using your website and they want to pay for their products, but you've got thousands of people wanting to use your website. Great example of using a serverless function for that payment service is there. It can scale automatically on demand. Of course you can do it with containers and virtual machines, but it's more costly. And we'll come to that in a minute. You pay for the code execution time only. Now this is really interesting, uh, and we'll get into why in a moment. But you only care as to whether that function enters and stops, and that's all you pay for. That's the purpose of serverless. You're just looking at the execution time now. Okay, you don't pay for anything extra. You're not looking at idle services. You're not paying for idle servers, give or take. And you want high availability and fault tolerance. When you hit that function, you want it to run and you want it to always run. No matter where you are, you want it to be fault tolerant and you always want to get it. So let's break this down a little bit further. Let's look at a container because this is a really good way to look at it. The eagle eyes of you would look at that and say, you have got a typo in that second line. It says, hello, dev loppers. Okay, as a container, you now need to rebuild this entire thing and run the pipeline and redeploy it. That's costly, that's time. Okay, just for a simple change. Let's say we had functions, functions as a service. Version one in the middle, version two at the top. I've made that change at the very top. I've made that typo, fixed it. It's now version two. As long as there's a common interface across all of your functions, and as long as they can talk to each other, that's all you need, okay? As long as there's that common communication vector. <coughs> so what challenges do we face? Because it's all good that functions and serverless is wonderful, but what challenges do we look at and we have problems with? Long-running processes is something which I found to be a big sticking point. I'd look at engineering teams and I look at products that are you know, executing time for more than 10, 15, 20 minutes. Not good, because in Azure, uh, or an Azure function, the maximum time you can run a function for is 10 minutes and the default is five. So that's where you have a problem. Right? That's the hard stop. You don't want functions to be running for a long time. That's, cost, that's so inefficient with your costing. And again, with lambdas, I believe it's 15 minutes is the absolute max. Again, you don't want it to be taking that long. Test-driven development is really difficult. Okay? Who here does a lot of test-driven development? Okay, so you understand the pain when things fail. Okay? When you're looking at functions, and you're looking at functions in the cloud, you're touching the tip of the iceberg. Therefore, you then need to emulate that locally if you want to test it on your machine. There's ways around it, but it's really difficult. I mean, with Azure, we have Azure Core Tools, which is basically emulating what you have in the cloud. I'm not sure what you use in AWS. I just use the console. I just use the AWS console for this one, right? I, I don't know. But this is hard. This is a challenge you face with serverless functions. Vendor lock-in is an interesting one. So a lot of Service providers will build and create tools which are great in their ecosystem. The golden path will talk to A and B, but if you, as soon as you want to go outside of that bucket and start talking to different service providers, it becomes a challenge. There's not always a common interface. But we'll get around that in a minute, and I'll show you how I did. Cold starts, another big one, another problem. Okay, an analogy. 
Let's say I'd fallen asleep on the sofa and somebody had whacked me and said, hey Liam, come on, wake up, let's do some dishes. You know, go and wash up. I have to process that, I have to wake up. Got to get my fingers wet. Got to get in the kitchen, got to do something. If I'm already awake and I'm up and I'm mopping the floor and somebody says, hey Liam, come and do the dishes. All right, drop the mop and go. Okay, so you've got that initial startup time. Of course, there's ways around it, but you sometimes find the latency. If you're in a high distribution system and you need that latency to be really, really low, that could be a problem. But if you don't, then it doesn't matter. But it's something which can become an issue later down the line. And of course, there is a common misconception. I have talked a lot about functions and code and functions as a service. Serverless isn't just code. It is applications as well, or services. Container services, for example. Azure Container Instances is serverless. AWS Fargate is serverless. GCP uh, Cloud Run, serverless. Scaling down to zero, only paying for what you use is important. Data storage, because databases can be serverless too. Cosmos DB and Azure. S3, storage, serverless. GCP Cloud Spanner, serverless. You kind of get the point here. And again, with application integration, there's serverless services everywhere. It's not just code. So let's look at a three-tier application. Hopefully, a lot of people would have uh, seen this before. You've got a client, you've got your front end, you've got the logic, which is the server, and you've got the database, which is your storage. Doesn't matter what you're using, Angular, React, Apache, Mongo, whatever. Typical three-tier application. I want to move that to serverless you would need an event source trigger. So you need something to kick it off. Something needs to start that, it's event driven. So whether that is a RESTful API call, whether it's data change, whether it is a message in a queue, whether it's a state change, it can be anything. As long as it is binary, it's a kick or a flick, like a switch. Then it calls a function which can be written in whatever language you like, TypeScript, Go, Python, you name it, whatever supports it. And a fun fact, Azure doesn't actually have a build pack or runtime for Go. Can't do it. There's ways around it by using a custom handler, but you can't do it. That just emulates a HTTP server. So, whatever you're using, it can be done in a serverless manner. And then, of course, that hits a service of your choice. How did I do it? How would I do this? So, I had a client UI. I used app services to deploy a React application. I then broke all that server logic down into functions, event driven architectures. So, add to cart serverless function, add to catalog, serverless function, and of course payments. So it's a really good example of how you can break this down and demodularize it, decouple it, and have it into a serverless architecture. And of course, hitting Cosmos DB. Another case study which I built recently, which was actually quite interesting, was a reporting pipeline. Now, Satya Nadella, Microsoft CEO, people in that theater, I wanted to capture their attention some people are going to be looking at their phones, some of their feet, some twiddling their thumbs. They're going to be doing different things whilst watching that. And of course, some people might be watching. How did I go about capturing it? What did I do? Well, I had an event source. So every single night at midnight, I kicked off a trigger. That hit a generator function. Now, the generator function went off to a Wasabi or called a Wasabi storage bucket, which underneath it is S3. So here we're looking outside of that vendor lock-in. Right, we're starting to reach outside of our golden path on our bucket to grab some data. Because all of that data, all that metric was just dumped into this storage bucket. From then, I went to an Azure storage queue. And that filled up, and as it filled up, passed it over to a delegator function, which does exactly what it says on the tin. It delegates. It called three other processor functions. And of course, you can see this is all starting to build up quite nicely with the serverless functions. Now these processed the data, and these scaled horizontally. So as these are scaling horizontally, that load, no matter how many items of data I had, it could scale. And then I just dumped it back in another Wasabi bucket. But that was good for me, because I now had ordered data. The data looked something like this instead. So it wasn't perfect, but it was ordered and it was more organized. And that's what I cared about at that time. Why did I create it this way? Well, it was simple to stand up within the structure as code. It was, you know, create this, do this, do this, do this. It was very sequential, and it was good. Easy to transfer to different cloud providers. That Azure function could quite simply be a, uh, a Lambda function in AWS. 
Easy. The same with the storage cube. Could be SQS in AWS or equivalent in another cloud provider. Functions are also awesome for ad hoc processing. I don't want them on all the time. I didn't need them on all the time. I just needed them on at midnight. Horizontal scaling allowed me to scale this as and when I needed it, depending on the data that I had. If I had a virtual machine and I only had 10 pieces of data, well, there was a problem because that's a really big beefy machine for a really small amount of data. Whereas I could do that in one function and that's all I'd need at that point. And of course, the pipeline allowed for thousands of uh, processes to be continued at once. So, DevOps. Let's look at some DevOps. What is it? Well, DevOps is deploying and releasing regularly. The iteration, we've all probably seen this infinity loop, it's a continuous loop. You're iterating over a common problem as a team. And of course you want to automate that to get it as quick as possible. So it basically solves this big problem of having long development life cycles. Now, how does serverless impact DevOps? Because I often see uh, people say, you know, DevOps is dying, DevOps is this, DevOps is that, because serverless is the new next greatest thing. I hear that all too often, but it doesn't. It actually helps quite a lot. Let's take the code stage, for example. Writing functions, not application stacks. Okay, you're not coding many things at once. You're not caring about the servers or anything like that. You just care about the code. Now, you could say that that is, I don't know, you'd be looking at VS Code or you'd be coding locally and then you'd have to deploy it. But with a function, you just have to care about that one function. One function to do one thing. Look at deployments. This is where you get to the cloud much quicker. Okay, whether it is with a GitHub pipeline or whether it is uh, you're deploying to Azure through the plugins. All serverless. There's a lot of serverless services you'll be using. And monitoring, of course. Granular logs and status indications. You can get this, of course, from containers and virtual machines, but with functions, you have the APIs and you're able to jump in straight into the calls. You're able to get out those call stacks and it's a lot more obvious what is being called and how and when. So what problem does serverless really solve? Well, it brings your cost down. Everybody likes that. Businesses do. Your time to market goes down because you're spending less time developing and your development goes up. So I have a short demo uh, of using the Azure Developer CLI uh, and what this is basically going to do is create this architecture for us. So we have got a React front end which calls a, uh, will create a, um, or call sorry, a Azure function with fast API in Python which has a storage account attached to it and I apologize this is all very Azure but this is what we work with. Uh, security, we have got um, Key Vault and uh, some keys. We have got Azure Cosmos DB to store the data, and we have got Azure Monitor to tell us exactly what is going on. Now, I apologize, it might be quite small. Uh, when I was recording it, this was probably about as big as I could get, but I'll talk through it. So here, I'm just going to log into Azure using the CLI, which is uh, AZD auth login. And what it's gonna go do is basically log me into Azure for me. Now, what this project has got is a bunch of BICEP files. So BICEP is a domain specific language, which is kind of similar to Terraform. Um, and it just goes off and creates a whole bunch of resources for me. Now I've selected my location where I want to deploy it. And I sped this up. This took about eight minutes in total. Uh, so I sped this up. I'm not sure how to get rid of that by the way. Go. And it's just verifying everything is done. And this is in code spaces, by the way. So code spaces is uh, basically VS Code in a container in the browser for you. So this is all up in there and you all have access to this. Uh, so now it's just a simple to-do app. There's nothing special about this one. Uh, but what it is doing is creating lots of API calls for me. It's creating data. So I actually have to do this. So I'm going to ring mother. I'm going to go shopping. I'm going to add some things to a basket. Just creating that data for me. I had a bit too much fun when recording this, by the way. <laughs> and then we jump out. So what I actually want to go see is the monitoring in a moment. So once I'm done with all of this, we want to go and check out how to monitor it. How do I find out what's actually going on? So I'm going to go to AZD Monitor. And what that's going to do is open up my Azure portal, and it's going to let me see everything, all the granular data that's going on between that application. 
And because it's so decoupled and because it is um, all available to you, you can see each and individual request. So I split it down to the last 30 minutes and admittedly you don't really see much, there's a little spike going on, but the important part comes in a moment. So there's no failed requests, there's no failed responses. Uh, what I'm able to do is just jump around and actually have a really good look at what's going on. And we're gonna show you in a second the two serverless services which I'm using of both functions and services. So here we go. I, you can see here, I've made 48 requests and I can jump in, I can see the logs, I can see everything I need to see with this application that I've created. I know it's nothing special, but it demonstrates the purpose of being able to see such a granular level within this application. Now, if this was a virtual machine, if this was a container, you'd be getting the same logs or similar logs, but it would be a little bit more difficult to get those out. I think that is the end. So, yep, we can see here, uh, I've got three services, three processes. So that's how many it spun up for me whilst I was uh, playing with it. And that's just a really good demonstration and a graphical way to see how we're getting the data. So, serverless services, I had a function app which was under or within a storage, uh, storage uh, account in my account. And of course we had a Cosmos DB database which was serverless. So who wants to take a punt at this one? In 2023, how much do you think it costs to start your tech company today? About the same. Oh. 500K. Someone said it. About $50,000 near enough. For a proper tech company, I'm not, I'm not talking about something you spin up in your bedroom, I'm talking about a, you know, something you do in your garage. That's 1% of what it initially costs over 23 years. So that's a really awesome way to demonstrate how we have come and how far we've come in what? Since the start of this century? It's pretty cool. Key takeaways that I'd love you to take away from today. Okay, serverless gives you more of a granular insight. That's what I found whilst playing with serverless functions as opposed to containers, because my background was with containers. You can't use it for everything. We established you can't use it for long-running processes. Pipelines is pretty difficult. And number three, the best way to see if it works for you and your applications is just to give it a go, break it down, and give it your best shot. Thank you very much. Great stuff, Ian. Great stuff. Thank you. Um, okay, let's just have just a couple of questions. Um, got a few to choose from here. So, you're off a couple of questions to them? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Let's go to you, sir. Uh, how can uh, uh, the portability of uh, the application of the solution uh, is, is having this so much control that we can either we can distribute this, this application between multiple vendors or we transfer the load or we uh, just partially move part of the solution to the different vendors or something like that. Do we have a control on the portability of the application? Uh, I wouldn't say you have control on the, on the portability, um, but the best way that I found doing it was to try out how I can, or, or the access um, that I had between different vendors. So when I was looking at Wasabi Bucket, I was looking at the APIs which I needed to hit in order to do that, and obviously what was input and output from my functions with Azure. Um, it's not the same across all different cloud vendors, so is it Basically, a trial and error for me at that point, um, which is why I was breaking it down. Cool. Okay, question at the back there? Hello, hi. Hello. Yep, we're Hello. good. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Yeah. Thanks a lot, man. A good presentation. Uh, I got a few questions that we, even we can take it off in as well. Just one. Uh, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, usually, these presentations, uh, I do currently use serverless uh, AWS uh, in my book office. However, this presentation doesn't talk about what serverless doesn't cover, like a high performance stuff or if it is a long running process. Usually, so we started serverless, but then we realized that the cost is much higher than our requirement, than the, we could have gone server based stuff or EC2, something like that. Definitely, Lambda was costing us more than what we could have done with, within AWS, other ways. So, if you could take a moment and educate us, like, where serverless doesn't fit. Because usually, if it is a shiny object, everybody runs towards that. I have seen it. Um, so if you could take a few moments, please. Yep, so serverless doesn't necessarily cover long-running processes very well, um, purely because of the cost-benefit that I've seen with my processes. So I use Azure, which is a little bit different to AWS. 
as we will see. Uh, but the, fun the underlying fundamentals are the same. Serverless is serverless. Um, yeah, it's not really the easiest thing to explain because when you have long running processes, the last thing you want to do is have something which is continuously idle and running in the cloud, right? That is expensive. Whereas if you have a container running, and it's a serverless service, you can drop it down to zero, so scalability becomes zero. That way you don't end up paying for that service, or at least in, AWS, uh, in Azure, I wasn't anyway. So that's how I was able to mitigate a lot of my costings through that method. So scaling down to zero, not having any idle processes. Okay, brilliant. I know there's more questions, but uh, unfortunately we are a bit short of time. So um, I'm sure Liam will very generously uh, answer some questions a bit later on. Um, but uh, give, it, give it up for Liam. Brilliant talk. Brilliant talk. Thank you.